Daniel Reisbeck is a fellow policy analyst in Cato Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, and he focuses on Latin America. Previously, he was a senior fellow at the Reason Foundation, the editor-in-chief of the Pan Am Post, and a lecturer at Universidad Francisco Marroquín in Guatemala. He frequently writes on Latin American affairs. His op-eds have appeared in the Wall Street Journal and Foreign Policy, among other prominent publications. And he joins the podcast today to discuss human progress and potential in Latin America, especially recent developments in Argentina. Daniel, how are you? Uh, fine. Thanks, Chelsea, for inviting me on. So what would you say are some of the biggest strengths and opportunities for Latin America today? Obviously, a fairly broad question. Right. Well, in terms of uh, liberty in, in general, and especially economic freedom, of course, the uh, experiment that we're now seeing in Argentina with the election of Javier Milei and and his uh, the beginning of his government. He took office on December 10th, and it's all quite encouraging on in in one sense, especially the deregulating part. Um, he had a, a pretty large decree uh, that repealed uh, many many laws and modified others uh, to really uh, liberate the Argentine economy, which has really been strangled over uh, recent decades. It's uh, one of the most regulated economies in the world. So that's very good news. He has another uh, big law in in Congress that uh, aims to do pretty much the same on the economic side and also has some, uh, say, political uh, aspects as well. Uh, so it's going to be very interesting uh, how that plays out. Um, it, it will depend, of course, a lot of it will depend on Congress where Millet doesn't have a, a majority and also on the courts because the courts can potentially block a lot of his his initiatives. Uh, but we have focused uh, here at, at Cato, uh, especially with my colleague uh, Gabriela Calderon, on his main proposal during his campaign, which was the dollarization of Argentina's economy, which we think uh, is, is the most important uh, proposal and, and one. I mean, Cato is one of the few institutions and perhaps the only institution in Washington, I believe, that has actually paid attention to dollarization in Latin America over the past uh, three or four decades. And uh, in general, we think it's, it's a very good policy that uh, there are only three dollarized countries so far. They are smaller countries, Panama, Ecuador, and El Salvador. And we think it would be a, a very big deal and very positive for Argentina if it were to dollarize. But so far, uh, sadly, I think I've been disappointed with uh, the beginning of Millet's government, but we can discuss that further if you like. And that is fascinating. Let's uh, first sort of set the stage. Could you describe the situation in Argentina before Millet and what was going on and what sort of situation he's inherited? Right. Well, the main problem, and uh, the polls, uh, opinion polls confirmed this, was inflation, which was uh, running at around 140 percent at the time of his election in, in November. And it's actually been increasing. Uh, so, right, when you have triple digit inflation, it's it's definitely a, a big problem. And of course, this is caused by uh, the central bank and uh, Argentina central bank is particularly uh, irresponsible even within a Latin American context. Uh, for instance, it had uh, billions and billions of dollars in uh, interest-bearing liabilities, and it was basically just uh, funding the banks, especially the, the banks, commercial banks in Argentina, uh, were lending to the central bank, and it was basically a, a Ponzi scheme in which uh, you had, of course, 130% or so interest rates on very short-term bonds. And this was something that was bound to collapse. And uh, Millet's government has taken uh, some steps to to remedy this, uh, basically by transferring uh, many, if not all, of these bonds to the treasury. And you still have the debt problem, but uh, perhaps it's not uh, as explosive. And of course, you had, as a result of this, of, of the inflation, uh, largely, but not only, you, you also had, a, as I said, one of the most regulated economies in the world. Uh, you have 40% of the population uh, living in, in poverty and an economy that hasn't grown at all in uh, over a decade, uh, which is 
very sad if you think about it, because Argentina used to be, of course, around uh, 100 years ago, 120 years ago, one of the richest countries in the world. And its uh, decline has been uh, very marked and very steady. And it has coincided, of course, with the rise of nationalism at first and then with Peronism, which has been like the standard uh, prototypical Latin American corporatist uh, ideology. Could you contrast that with Malay's ideology and talk a little bit about what are his beliefs? What are his economic beliefs that are driving him? Well, Malay is interesting because uh, he describes himself as a classical liberal or a, a libertarian, uh, and he even goes farther and he even describes himself as an anarcho-capitalist. Uh, of course, saying that he has to govern more, more like a minarchist in terms of having a minimum state because he is governing a state after all. But uh, he was actually trained as a neoclassical economist, but he, he has uh, said in, in different interviews how he discovered the Austrian School of Economics relatively recently in 2013, I believe. He came across a text by Mises and Hayek, and, and he basically says that he saw the light and he became uh, basically a an adherent of the Austrian school, and uh, in that sense, uh, a libertarian or, or a classical liberal in, in the Austrian tradition. And uh, he was very, what's been surprising in Argentina is that he's been very open about it. He has never tried to soften his stances at all in order to appease some section of, of the electorate. Uh, he has been very adamant in, in defending freedom and uh, he is very talented in, in explaining these concepts, which he understands very well on an academic level. And he's also been a, a lecturer or, or professor at, at some uh, Argentine universities. But he's very skilled at communicating these ideas to the mass of the people. And uh, there's even a, a Twitter account that, that arose recently called Millet Explains with English subtitles, in which uh, they go through many interviews in which Millet is, is explaining different economic concepts as to, for instance, the causes of, of inflation or the effects of, of uh, regulation. And so he really does know what, what he's talking about. And he's also very good at, at uh, reaching a, a very broad audience. So I think uh, that's quite remarkable. And it is fascinating that those ideas have resonated with voters to the point that he was successfully elected. Can you talk a little bit about the classical liberal tradition in Argentina or Latin America? Right. And I should qualify that also in terms of Argentina has many classical liberal economists. I think on a per capita level, it's probably the, the highest uh, percentage in, in Latin America. They also have a long tradition of, of think tanks, uh, even beginning in the 1950s. Uh, one particular think tank started by a gentleman called Alberto Venegas Lynch, the father, whose son is also called Alberto Venegas Lynch. Uh, he was corresponding with uh, both Ludwig von Mises and uh, Friedrich Hayek, and he brought Mises to Buenos Aires, and Mises delivered a series of nine lectures in 1959 uh, there, which you know, they're still talked about. So Argentina does have, a, a, I would say, a very rich uh, intellectual tradition in, or academic tradition in, in the, let's say, Austrian school. Uh, at the same time, uh, Millet has a very sweet, generous background insofar as he's not only a, a you know, trained economist, he was also a semi-professional soccer player and he was also a rock singer, made part of a band that I think made uh, Rolling Stones covers. So he, uh, uh, he he's an entertainer and, and I think that was really what allowed him to, to sell his ideas. And there's a debate of to what extent did people actually vote for you know, Hayekian economic policy versus uh, how many people just voted for, for this um, entertainer who, who, as I said, is, is, is very skilled and also, you know, had a very radical speech against the political class, which had brought about this uh, economic disaster in which Argentina currently finds itself. All right. So he's got this eccentric uh, aspect, but also serious policy ideas. You talked about dollarization, how some other countries have tried that in Latin America. Could you describe more about this policy of dollarization? For people who aren't familiar with it, what is it? Why is it a good idea for Argentina 
And what are your hopes for Argentina if Millet is able to successfully dollarize? Right. Well, there are different types of dollarization, but um, basically uh, you grant the U.S. dollar legal tender, or at least you get rid of uh, of, of exclusive legal tender for a national currency in, in the home country. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Panama really was was born as an independent country with a lot of involvement from the United States, of course. So it was born dollarized in, in 1904. And then more recently, Ecuador dollarized in 2000 in, in the midst of a crisis quite similar to what Argentina is facing now. And El Salvador dollarized in 2001. And it had faced a similar crisis the previous decade. And then it had um, established a kind of fixed exchange rate mechanism. So they had already defeated the inflation problem, which is what dollarization does. Uh, when you dollarize, you basically end up with inflation levels pretty much akin to those of the United States, uh, which might be high now in the last few years from a U.S. perspective. But uh, when you have, for instance, 140 percent inflation in Argentina or uh, higher in, in Venezuela, then having you know seven or eight percent inflation really isn't that bad after all. And with all the problems that we know that occur with the Federal Reserve, uh, when you compare that to currencies, even in countries with responsible, so-called responsible and independent central banks that have had their currencies uh, devalue tremendously against the U.S. dollar, then from that perspective, then having the dollar is uh, really, really, really becomes quite a quite a good option. And uh, I'm not saying it should be the the only option. And I think Panama has a good model insofar as um, there is no um, established official currency. In theory, there's monetary freedom. And it just so happens that most people choose, uh, the overwhelming majority of people choose uh, U.S. dollars for their contracts and, and transactions. So uh, by taking away the local political class and, and uh, the power of local politicians to interfere in the monetary sphere and, and to print money and to monetize the debt, you just get rid of, of a huge problem. Now, that doesn't solve all other problems. Uh, for instance, Ecuador dollarized. It has dollarized countries have had by far the lowest inflation levels in the last uh, few decades. But that doesn't mean you're going to have very high economic growth automatically. Ecuador hasn't had that. But because they also had a, a radical left wing government and authoritarian government from 2007 to 2017. But um, as long as you get rid of inflation and the currency devaluation problem, that's just uh, very uh, important in these countries because the governments can still uh, run deficits and have debt problems. But when you have dollarization, those debt problems don't really affect the private sector and don't affect uh, a regular uh, citizen. Whereas when you have a national currency, then you have a debt crisis. It usually leads to to a deterioration of the currency and a loss in purchasing power. So maintaining that purchasing power, I think, is is key, which is why in, in these countries, nobody is thinking about de-dollarizing. Even in Ecuador, when uh, the left-wing strongman, Rafael Correa, was at the peak of his power and popularity with 60% uh, or above uh, in, in approval ratings, uh, the dollar was always more popular than, than he was. So he, he wanted to get rid of the dollar, but he was unable to do so. And that's also why we think it's important for Millet to dollarize and dollarize quickly, because you never know uh, if the Peronists come back to power, which they may, they could uh, overturn a lot of the measures he's taking now, for instance, deregulation. But if you dollarize, it's going, it's going to be very difficult for any future government to, to get rid of that. And uh, that's why we think it's such a good policy. So if he can implement it, it he's probably going to be able to keep it. But there are people who object. What are some of the criticisms of dollarization and what would you say to critics of this policy who are skeptical about it? Well, there are different types of critiques and uh, a standard left-wing argument is that you lose monetary sovereignty as if this were a terrible tragedy or that you surrender sovereignty to the United States and the Federal Reserve when that's not really the case. For instance, Panama um, it not only has dollarization, but it has a very uh, liberalized banking sector, uh, which means that monetary policy in the end uh, depends on internal factors. And uh, the Federal Reserve only affects uh, Panamanian monetary policy to the same extent that it does affect monetary policy in, in the rest of the world. 
Um, so I think that's just a nationalist and very emotional and, and bad argument because, uh, I mean, monet what what use is monetary sovereignty if your if your sovereign currency is losing value consistently against the dollar and causing inflation or helping to cause inflation? Um, a more technical argument that is constantly applied to Argentina uh, has more to do with the technique of of dollarizing or the mechanics, and it has been argued across the the English speaking press as well, that Argentina doesn't have enough dollars to dollarize. Uh, this is really not the case because it, it's true that the Argentine state is basically bankrupt and, and doesn't have too many dollars and, and definitely not enough to cover the, the circulating currency, for instance. But if you look at the private sector and uh, just households, they have more than enough dollars. It's They have uh, over half of GDP, according to one estimate from the national uh, statistical institute. So what people do is that they keep dollars, uh, as they say in Argentina, under the mattress or maybe in safe deposit boxes or or abroad in, in the case of mostly companies. And when you dollarize, which is what happened in, in Ecuador, uh, you create a confidence shock in the banking system. So that creates um, a huge increase in deposits. And uh, in Ecuador, it, it's also false that you need to dollarize the entire circulating currency from one day to the next. Uh, in Ecuador, there was a mandate for a nine-month period in which both currencies, the Sucre, which was the old Ecuadorian currency, and the dollar, they circulated at the same time. And at, at the end of the nine-month period, you had to hand in all your Sucres for, for dollars. In El Salvador, it was a twenty. It was voluntary, but it took about 24 months for 90% of the of the local currency, the colones, to be to be dollarized. Uh, whereas the deposits, you you can really dollarize uh, overnight. So we see there's really no reason why Argentina couldn't follow a, a similar example as to what these countries did. Uh, so, so those are just some criticisms, but of course there are others as well. How hopeful are you that he'll be able to pull this off and actually implement dollarization? Yeah, well, it's a good question because uh, Millet actually came to power. This is a presidential system. It's not a parliamentary system, but he ended up winning as part of a coalition because he had to join forces with uh, former president Mauricio Macri's party. Uh, he had to have their support in order to win. He went into a runoff, which which he won, but he won because of that support. And uh, many people in, in that party are not really in favor of dollarization. And uh, the person that he put in charge of the finance ministry is former president Macri's, one of former president Macri's uh, former finance ministers. And he has spoken out against dollarization in the past. And uh, more recently, he has taken the view that, yes, it was a, camp a campaign promise and uh, it's still going to be met. But they've, they've taken the view that the fiscal issue is more important and that uh, dollarization will be a consequence of stabilizing the economy. Now, I think uh, that is a mistake. And I think you have to dollarize first. You have to solve the currency problem and you have to solve the, the monetary issues and inflation before you can really proceed with, with all, all other reforms. So I think it's more of a point of departure uh, instead of a destination, whereas it seems that Millet's government is uh, regarding it in the other way around. And uh, I think it's potentially a mistake. So dollarization, obviously a big proposal, but there are others as well, various deregulatory reforms. What other promises has Millet made? Well, it's it's very far reaching and in in both the decree and the and the omnibus law, which is a, a very wide ranging law, uh, there it, it just really deregulates very broad swaths of the Argentine economy. So one example is uh, they got rid of price controls for rents and meaning uh, real estate which had even caused a shortage. There were price control laws dating back even from the 1970s that were scrapped. Uh, there was even a more recent law that uh, determines what can and cannot be displayed <laughs> by stores and supermarkets on their shelves. Um, so, so those are all very, I think, healthy and, and uh, positive uh, deregulatory uh, measures. Uh, another one that has been very popular and that has been commented on is the open skies policy or basically um, cutting down on the on on the monopoly of of especially one 
national airline and allowing airlines from abroad to enter the market and even um, uh, control flights within the country. Um, because basically what they had was a scheme to uh, undercut the low cost airlines in favor of the national airline, which um, of course is, is heavily subsidized. And uh, Millet even went so far as saying that he is uh, handing over this national, in terms of privatization, he's not selling it. Instead, he's just handing it over to the workers uh, and, of course, cutting subsidies. And you had a very interesting reaction from the far left. Uh, and suddenly, because, of course, they've been saying for years that <laughs> companies, enterprises should belong to workers. And Millet is saying, OK, here, I, I give it to you for free. And then they're saying no. <laughs> so... Uh, Right, it's uh, a bit uh, funny in, in in that sense, but uh, really, it, there's there's a wide scope of things that that you could really uh, talk for a long time about. So these are just some some highlights. That is fascinating. But you did mention earlier that in some ways you have been also disappointed uh, with Millet. Uh, everything you described so far sounds fairly positive. Are there any yeah. areas where you feel he could be doing more to promote freedom and prosperity and so forth? Well, I mean, I think everything on the deregulation side and and um, the economic freedom side is is very positive, as, as I mentioned. My, my main concern is on the monetary side, uh, where I think that, I mean, they've kept, uh, for instance, they've kept the an official exchange rate. They adjusted it because they had a an exchange rate that was at around 400 uh, Argentine pesos to a dollar, whereas the blue dollar, which is a black market rate, and which is that it's not a complete complete free market rate, but it's the closest thing you have to a, to a free market rate, was at around and, and even over a thousand. So uh, they adjusted that, and they they said it's going to be 800 with a two percent increase uh, per month. So you would say it's it's an improvement, but you still have an official rate. Where, whereas uh, what you should do, especially in terms of dollarization, is to is to liberate the, the exchange rate. And um, you have, of course, for instance, uh, another measure uh, another measure that um, I think is is not ideal is a five percent tax that they placed on withdrawing dollars from the banking system. So. There's no tax to introduce dollars, but uh, there's a 5% tax to withdraw dollars. And I think this is mistaken because you should be generating confidence in the banking system and you should be trying to increase uh, deposits as, as much as possible. And this makes you think twice, of course, if you deposit and then you're going to be charged to to uh, withdraw, uh, then I don't think it's it's, it's the best policy. And, and there are other distortions that really you should either get rid of or not introduce in the first place, especially to advance towards dollarization. But we're not seeing that in, in the first month of, of the government in office, um, at least until now. Now, Mile has said that things will get worse before they get better, which is um, perhaps an unusually uh, non-sunny statement for a politician. Uh, how long do you think before we start to see some positive effects from these reforms? Yeah, again, I, it's a very good question, but I, I do think a lot of it depends on on the monetary policy because, of course, I think the deregulation aspect can can be very positive uh, as well because, as I said, the economy has been absolutely strangled. But uh, the thing with uh, the minister, who's called uh, Caputo, so uh, the Caputo plan uh, apparently involves uh, liquefying the debt uh, in terms of, uh, for instance, these bonds that I mentioned, very short, short term bonds were paying uh, around 130 percent. And uh, when they were transferred, now they're they have a longer duration and they're paying around 100 percent. So you're you're liquefying that debt uh, through through inflation. And in order to strengthen the peso, they're also offering even longer term bonds that um, would yield something around 180 percent per annum. So it's I think it's there's very complex uh, financial measures being being carried out here. Uh, but the thing the thing with liquefying the, the government's debt is that you're liquefying everyone's savings and everyone's uh, salary. So I think it's it's a bold and even and even dangerous alternative. Uh, 
And uh, I also think if you if you dollarize, it it involves a similar process because once you dollarize, or or once the market realizes you're serious about dollarizing, uh, the obvious thing would be for inflation to uh, to begin to decrease uh, and quite rapidly, and um, also for interest rates to to come down as well. Uh, but you do that without uh, destroying purchasing power even more, and and I think that would be the the, the better scenario. So the main obstacle then is political, whether he can convince his coalition to go along with dollarization. How hopeful do you feel that he will? Well, see? I mean, it, it's hard to tell because even towards the end of the campaign, Millet wasn't talking about dollarization as much. Mm -hmm. And he was definitely not going into details about how he would dollarize. Uh, one thing that did happen was that he had named uh, before he he won the election, one particular person, um, was Antonio Campo, as the next president of the central bank, and he said that his only mission would be to shut it down. So of course, his promise involved dollarizing and shutting down the central bank, which is the ideal scenario under dollarization. And uh, when he adopted Caputo's view, and he was about to name Caputo, it involved Ocampo not not assuming the presidency of the of the central bank, and uh, it's not clear to what extent this was a this was a decision made out of political expediency and, and necessity, or to what extent Millet actually believes in what Caputo is doing. Because the thing with dollarization is that it's such a kind of a niche subject and. It's only three countries have dollarized. They're, they're small countries. Not a lot of people have paid attention to it, even though it's been terribly successful, uh, especially in terms of bringing down inflation. That uh, really, I think there's few economists in in the world that understand it and, and also understand how to bring it about. And um, so the question is, how much Millet is is convinced or or is still convinced with the measure? Or to what extent it's just uh, a, a political uh, act to to buy some time in order to dollarize. But even if that's the case, I think that's still a mistake. Still a lot of hopeful signs. Now, we do want to talk about Latin America more broadly and not just Argentina. Do you see Millet's election as part of a broader trends toward greater embrace of liberty and economic freedom? Or do you see this as more of an isolated, uh, hopeful case in Latin America? Yeah, on, another good question. I think maybe both <laughs> um, both possibilities are, are in play. I think someone like Millet won because of the combination of factors that I mentioned. The fact that you have 100 30, 140% inflation, then people start paying attention to actually what causes inflation. So it's a very uh, positive environment for a, a libertarian and even a, a radical libertarian to uh, to gain people's attention. Uh, on the other hand, you have Millet's particular talents, which, which I also mentioned. Um, on the other hand, I, I think that uh, this, this came about in 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 a, in a Latin American perspective, recent elections have gone rather to the left, and in some cases to the far left, as in the case of Colombia, which elected a, a basically a Marxist president in twenty twenty two. You had the recent election in Brazil when uh, Lula da Silva came to power. You had uh, the election in Chile several years ago when Gabriel Boric, who is uh, basically in a coalition with a with the Communist Party, and is and is far to the left. Uh, came to power and tried to undo Chile's very successful constitution. So I wouldn't say that Millet, Millet's election is part of a trend, but he could begin a trend um, towards more classical liberal ideas. What I see from other countries, because in many countries they're saying we need our own Millet, uh, the problem is that when you don't have such a rich academic tradition of, of classical liberalism and uh, you don't really have a lot of people who, who understand what these ideas really mean, you you can end up with maybe some very shallow attempts at copying what Millet is doing, especially more on the histrionic side, but without the, the policy um, 
seriousness that that there is there. So in that sense, I think you have to be careful because um, I think Millet is a is a very unique uh, politician, and uh, whether or not that can translate in in more libertarians coming to power in in other countries is is I think uh, an open question. Obviously, the situation in Argentina is unique, but are there any other countries in uh, Latin America where you feel particularly hopeful about recent developments or where you think uh, things might be ripe for positive change? Well, it's another good question. In in general, Latin America uh, has not shown a lot of proclivity towards freedom and definitely not in, in recent years. Of course, there are some exceptions. Uh, now, I think Chile uh, is on a very positive note because after many difficult years, they had uh, massive uh, protests in in 2019 that led to uh, former president, uh, center-right president Sebastián Piñera, leading to offer a referendum on the constitution, the 1980 constitution, which was originally approved under the military government of uh, Augusto Pinochet, but it was later amended many times, particularly in 2006 under uh, center-left social democratic administration. So it's it's not really, uh, uh, you know, uh, the same document that was that was uh, introduced by by that military government. Um, and after several new plebiscites and and elections, what ended up happening is that people rejected the new election, the the new constitution that was presented, which is a radical far left constitution that even the Economist uh, criticized. So uh, I think in that sense, Chile, after some turbulence, can return to some to some stability. And of course, it's it's the freest economy in in the region, and uh, hopefully, it can it can return to to what it was uh, some maybe ten years ago. Uh, and elsewhere, I think it it really depends on on the context. It really depends on on the country. In, in Venezuela, you know, it's back and forth. Um, the Maduro regime has promised uh, free and fair elections this year, but I personally doubt that that will happen. There might be an election, but uh, probably not very free or very fair. And the question there is whether the, the main opposition candidate, Maria Corina Machado, who is uh, relatively friendly to classical liberal ideas, she just won a... Um, uh, a primary organized by the opposition independently, uh, not through the, the Venezuelan state itself, with over 90% of the vote. But uh, the thing is that uh, the Maduro regime several years ago disqualified her from running in any official election. And uh, now it is clear that she is, or she, she should be the official uh, candidate of the opposition. But the question is whether they will allow her to, to run or not, or the question is whether they will allow a free and fair election. And I think it's it's very doubtful. And otherwise, really, you, you can go country by country uh, analyzing the, the situation. But I would say that uh, Argentina will be the, the main uh, focus, at least of libertarian attention d- during the next few years. And I think that the success or failure of Millet can determine uh, the future of of, um, let's say, a, liber- a Latin American libertarian movement in general. It's an exciting time. Now, obviously, it's a very diverse region. Lots of different things are going on. But you've talked about some of the strengths, some of the opportunities. What about some of the biggest challenges facing Latin America and some of the biggest threats to progress and to the region becoming more prosperous? Right. Right. Yeah, I think there are several threats or, or obstacles. Um, many of them are commented on. One that is not very uh, known <laughs> is the lack of trade within the region. So Latin America is um, far less integrated in terms of trade between countries than North America, and, and this includes Mexico within within NAFTA or NAFTA 2.0, um, the USMCA. 
Uh, but I'm speaking of the rest of Latin America. Uh, it's far less integrated than North America and uh, Europe, in, especially in the European common market. And if you think of the population and um, the um, common, you have a com mostly common language, except for maybe Brazil and, and a few other uh, smaller countries, um, very common institutions, historical backgrounds, you would think that it's a very uh, ideal region to, to trade, but uh, trading within, within countries is, is very difficult, even migrating within Latin American countries. A lot of the immigration debate in the United States focuses solely on how difficult it is to migrate legally into the US, which is true, of course, but uh, few people comment on how difficult it is to migrate from one Latin American country to the other and how many restrictions there are. And many of these countries, for instance, Colombia, where, I from, where I'm from, there's restrictions on, for companies, for private companies, on how many foreigners they can hire. And uh, this is just standard across the region. Um, so I would say trade, uh, migration. And I would say one problem is that you never had, even uh, to the extent that, for instance, the, the Anglo sphere had uh, a certain or, or even very strong classical liberal element in the center right, at least until Trump came to power. Uh, you and you, you can think of Thatcherism and Reaganism and and uh, these types of, of politicians and movement. You never really had that um, in general in the Latin American right. The Latin American right has been traditionally very protectionist, um, very uh, corporatist. So uh, that's why also the Millet phenomenon is, is interesting because, uh, you're, of course, you, you have to break from the leftist model, both in its uh, Chavista phase and an aspect, um, and also with the Peronist, with the Argentine Peronist model, which has been influential. And, and Peron had many imitators uh, across the region. But you also have to break with, uh, with uh, let's say, more crony capitalist or protectionist right, an interventionist right. Uh, and I think that's what Millet did in terms of rhetoric, at least. Uh, and I think that's where the, the litmus test is, of whether this can be repeated in, in other countries. Because I think you, you have to break with, with both sides because um, maybe you know, a, a, a right-wing government in, in one country especially after the era of, of the military dictatorships, might not bring about a humanitarian collapse as occurred in Venezuela, which of course was all uh, to a great extent orchestrated and organized by, by Cuba. But at the same time, these, these governments don't allow with their policies and, and their protectionism and interventionism, they don't allow these economies to grow. And of course, if you don't grow, you're not gonna be able to lift people out of poverty. And, and that's the big problem in, in Latin America. It's, it's uh, anemic economic growth. And it's a question of how conscious people are of the fact that you need freedom in order to have that economic growth. Staying zoomed out to that level of political and economic philosophy, obviously Latin America is much poorer than its northern neighbors, the United States and Canada. Would you say that one of the main things holding Latin America back is this lack of promotion of economic freedom on both sides of the political spectrum. Yes, totally. I, I think I see it in my own country in in Colombia. Um, I think it's a it's a good example because, of course, you have you have the left and you have the communists and you still have communist guerrillas. Uh, which have become also involved in the drug trade. But on the other side, where, where you have the, the business sector and, and, and the center right. Um, so if you're against the communists in, in theory, so you would be pro-business. But the thing is that in, in, in this scenario, being pro-business also means being pro-trade restrictions and pro-subsidies and um, in favor of, of all these vested interests. And there really hasn't been an an alternative, and of course, maybe if if you have to choose, it's it's better to have that uh, protectionist model that at least allows some economic growth and having a, uh, 
uh, a Venezuela type regime. It's true. And the same as, as it's true to have, it's better to have um, a 10 or 12 percent inflation uh, as Colombia has had over the last few years and, you know, 140 percent inflation or, or higher. But uh, you really need to break with that model. And that's why I think, uh, for instance, dollarization is so important, because with dollarization, um, you, you, you don't you don't have that problem. You you completely exclude the political class from from monetary policy. And, and that's positive. And there's some other areas where you can uh, do that as well. For instance, in, in, in the legal sphere with um, uh, arbitration. I think that's a term. I'm not sure if that's a term. Arbitration, is that a term? Uh, where, you, where you basically outsource um, many of your, you outsource part of your legal system to say a court in London. I think that's very positive and, and um, it's something that, that should be done. Um, but Right. In, in general, I think that uh, the, the, this is a problem and I think it's it's the main problem. Uh, whereas in a lot of academia and, and in a lot of the media, they're looking more at symptoms of the problem like inequality or um, uh, right, the concentration of resources. And, and you, you also have a lot of uh, stereotypes that do the rounds. For instance, there's a lot, they're still talking about how these uh, large extensions of lands and uh, latifundios is... is the term generally used is, is such a problem when uh, and, and you generalize that across the region where I don't think it, it applies to every country. Uh, but at any rate, uh, what, what you need um, in terms of developing the agricultural sector is it's, all, it's, it's also you need um, economies of scale. And uh, you're probably not going to do that by, you know, having land reform and and uh, um, breaking up uh, large, large uh, estates. And as long as they're legally held and, and acquired, of course. But, I mean, incredibly in these countries, you're still debating this constantly. So it's, it's also a, a matter of, of, of mentality. that You still have the mentality that uh, Latin America is poor because other regions are rich or that other regions have become rich at the expense of, of Latin America. And you really have to overcome this and realize that, you know, wealth creation is, a, is, a, is not a zero-sum game. And I think that might be the, the first step. And it's, of course, more cultural and, and educational than, than anything else. And of course, there's a lot of work to be done in, in that area. And as you pointed out, with the common language um, and cultural similarities, you would expect if trade barriers come down for there to be an incredible potential there for uh, economic exchange between countries. How can Latin America unlock its potential? I think, again, it's Millet, I think, has all, all the right ideas for, for Argentina. And in, in, the thing is, in Argentina, it's not, you know, they're not starting from scratch because they had this incredibly successful experiment in the 19th century, uh, going back to the 1853 constitution, which was drafted based on the ideas of a classical liberal author called Juan Bautista Alberti. And what Alberti says basically was that, uh, you had had after independence, you had had several lost decades because people were still obsessed with military glory and and uh, these kinds of things and uh, protectionism. Where what, what you needed was free trade, unrestricted industry, free immigration, uh, and uh, basically building infrastructure to connect a, a very large country, especially through uh, railroads and um, and a, a river network. And that's what they did. And it, it wasn't immediate. It took a few decades, but basically from 1880 to 1916, and, and you had elected governments, although with problems, of course, uh, but you had this very successful export model that, um, as, as we've said, turned Argentina into one of the richest countries in the world. And um, of course, with 1916, 1920, everything that's happening in the world, uh, the rise of nationalism that took hold in Argentina, and eventually that morphed into Peronism, and you have the very clear decline ever since. And Millet's message, which I think is correct, is basically saying we don't even need to invent anything new. We just have to go, we just have to go back to our, to our roots, our, our classical liberal roots. So it's been done before. There's no reason why it can't be done again. But uh, I think that right, a, a lot of the problem is not just the, the communism and, and the Peronism 
in, in academia and, and in much of politics. It's also that the alternative to that until now has not been uh, kind of a unfettered free market or even kind of Thatcherite economic policies. It's been rather kind of this dirigiste middle of the road kind of system that um, has has really failed, I think, to let these countries grow at, at fast rates. And these countries need to grow at, at fast rates. They need catch up growth. And I think uh, that mentality is just, is just not there. Um, you look at Argentina, but this is also seen in countries like Colombia. These countries have incredibly high tax rates for, um, for instance, for in, in corporate taxes or, or in VAT as well. And when you think of what Latin America needs in order to bring investment and to, and to bring uh, companies and, and, and to uh, allow new industries to, to surge, of course, is you need uh, competitive tax rates. That you can't have higher tax rates than the United States or Europe when you have a lot of problems in, in these countries that you don't have in, in the developed world. But uh, there, has, there's, there has also been the mentality of we need to, to implement some of the policies that rich, uh, maybe Scandinavian countries have been applying lately. And I think um, Johan Norberg has written about this before. You don't need to see what Sweden, for instance, has been doing in the last 50 years or so, even though there's some positive positive measures in, in the last decades, I think, that are overlooked. But what you have to do is you have to look at how a Sweden, for instance, became developed in, in the first place in, in the 19th century, especially with, with basically a, a laissez-faire um, type of policy. And uh, this has been, I think, completely overlooked. And again, the, the positive or, or one very positive aspect of, of Millet or of the Millet phenomenon is that it's uh, helping to raise this debate, again, this essential philosophical debate, uh, not only in Argentina, but I think across the region. Do you have any thoughts on the potential of conflict to disrupt um, positive reforms across the region, what, what with recent events around Guyana and so forth? Right. Well, okay, we, we can mention Guyana, but I would also say that there already is a lot of conflict that yeah. mostly it relates to the to the drug war. Uh, this is seen most clearly in the case of of Mexico, the way the cartels have have taken over large swaths of the country. And since uh, the Mexican government decided in two thousand and six to combat the cartels with the Mexican army, you have seen uh, an explosion in terms of uh, the rise of homicide rates. Uh, in a country like Colombia, you of course narco trafficking is 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 a huge problem, and um, the way that, that that I see it, or that that we've seen it also at, at Cato, is that you really can't solve this problem unless you recognize recognize the, the market dynamics, and that as long as uh, the product is is illegal, while well, you maintain the supply, especially in the developed world. Well, you're going to turn a lot of the, the underdeveloped world, in this case, Latin America, into a war zone. And this is exactly what, what has been happening. Uh, but this is, of course, not this. Is, we're not talking about um, interstate conflicts. Now, what I see in with Venezuela and, and Maduro and, and Guyana is that there potentially could be a problem, uh, a conflict. I think Maduro has numerous incentives to to be quite aggressive against against Guyana, especially the the oil producing SAQO region, but but we'll see. I mean of course he, he also has incentives not to uh, pull off uh, a Vladimir Putin type move. But uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see. Um, it, of course it would it would mark a a departure from from what has been the norm in, in recent decades. But that doesn't mean that there hasn't been conflict. The thing is that the conflict has been more, quote unquote, uh, low intensity, but it's been, it has been still quite brutal in, in many countries. We try to end on a positive note, usually with this podcast. So what are you the most optimistic about with regards to the region's future? Right. Well, yeah, I'm not going to be terribly original here, but if you just, to get some context, if you go back a few years time, five, 10 years, if I would have told you, or if someone would have told me, you know, in, in a few years, you're going to have an openly libertarian president of, 
of a major country, Argentina, who's not only libertarian, but is actually an anarcho-capitalist, I would have likely not believed you. <laughs> and this is where we are. And I think the lesson is that, um, you know, sometimes it might seem very, very difficult to, to enact freedom-oriented reforms. Uh, and then all of a sudden you see a, a very clear example of, well, it can be done. It, it is being done now. And it is, it's being done by someone who was very radical in, in his approach. Uh, he wasn't, um, as I said, he, he wasn't moderating his, his principles in order to convince centrist voters or, or any, any kind of, he didn't have any type of, of tactic just, just to win. He was just very uh, straightforward. And, and I think that's very positive. And I think it's, it's an example to follow. It certainly taught me uh, a few lessons and, Maybe in a few years time, or at least my hope is that we'll have several and not just one libertarian president or, or libertarian oriented government. And we'll see how it plays out. Fingers crossed. All right. Thank you again so much for talking to me. This has been fascinating. Thank you, Chelsea. It was a pleasure. <laughs>